It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Perhaps you've experienced moments of doubt about your faith, or, or maybe you're one of the people who finds doubt to be more of a frequent companion in your spiritual life. Biblical scholar Peter N. suggests that part of the problem is many Christians have come to prize certainty as a hallmark of true faith in God. His new book is called The Sin of Certainty. Drawing on history, scripture, and personal experiences, Enns argues that believers can handle the most difficult questions if they stop needing to be right all the time and instead focus more on trusting God. Doubt, he writes, is only the enemy of faith when we equate faith with certainty. The book is The Sin of Certainty. The author is Peter Enns on this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Send questions and comments to mipodcast at byu.edu. And don't forget to rate the show in iTunes. We're here with Peter Enns. He's the Abram S. Clemens Professor of Biblical Studies at Eastern University, and that's in St. David's, Pennsylvania. He's a nationally recognized speaker. He's written a number of books, including Inspiration and Incarnation, which recently had a 10-year anniversary and was published in a new edition. We've spoken with him before on the podcast about his book, The Bible Tells Me So, but today we're talking about his new book, The Sin of Certainty, Why God Desires Our Trust More Than Our Correct Beliefs. Thanks for taking the time to do this, Pete. Sure, Blair, Thanks. yeah. Have you told the good people where we are right now? We're actually in the guest house at Brigham Young University. I am on Brigham Young University's campus. Yeah. Can you believe that? It's called the Garden Room. They, the Garden they Room, yeah. 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 But yeah. never been to Utah before, let alone... Really? Yeah, let oh, alone nice. uh, Brigham Young. So here I am. You're right in the heart of it. Heart of something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so... And we've talked before, last time we talked, The Bible Tells Me So had just come out, and, uh, and right. a lot of people really enjoyed that episode. And this book seems to be, um, rather than talking as much about the Bible itself, it's more about Christian faith. I, I wouldn't call it a spiritual autobiography, but there's a lot of autobiographical moments in the book. It seems like a really personal book. You started out innocently enough. You're on an airplane. You're heading home from an academic conference, and the flight offers various movies. And So you choose a Disney movie. It's got to be innocuous. You're not expecting a severe spiritual gut check but nevertheless <laughs> that's kind of what happens yeah it was um a book turned into a movie the bridge to terabithia and uh there was one scene you know not not to drag the whole scene out but there was one scene where three kids are basically talking about hell <laughs> and um one of the characters uh, she's a fifth grader she uh, didn't grow up in a religious home, and her two friends are pretty much from fundamentalist homes, and they're talking about how, you know, Christianity is scary, and, and you know, God's going to get you if you do something wrong, and you've got to read your Bible every day, you've got to go to church, and she had never been to church before, she went to church with them this one time. And um, she actually loved it. She didn't really care too much for the hellfire and brimstone, but she actually liked the experience. But uh, one of the characters said, you know, that, no, it's, it's it's scary. This is this is like, you, you know, it's not supposed God, to be a fun time. No, God you, will church. damn you to hell if you yeah. don't read your Bible. And and the other character, uh, the other character said, yeah, I, I just I don't believe that God damns people to hell. He's too busy running all of this. And she looks up at the sky and it's a beautiful day and the trees and the wind and all that. And, you know, everybody has a moment in their lives. And I've had many of these. But this is just a particular moment in an airplane where I guess in the back of my mind, I had been thinking to myself, my goodness, does God really do that to people? Is that what God is really like? And she was articulating something for me that I wasn't really at a place to articulate for myself. And it sort of caught me unawares because she was a fifth grader in a Disney movie. Right. Having, You're a Bible professor. And right? I'm, a, I'm a professor, yes. Oh, I write books and I have a PhD and all that, right? So, um, and that was just, you know, it's one of these sort of moments that's illustrative of something bigger, which is like moments catch you off guard in life and they sort of prick little holes in the balloons of our faith that we have where we set up these ironclad systems but that we're certain of you know I'm, I'm 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 certain of my theology i'm certain of what i believe but then life happens and it can be something like a movie on an airplane you know that you're not expecting and and all of a sudden you know you're not so sure anymore and you start thinking and questioning which can be unsettling and even a little bit threatening and, and you talk about a little bit about some of the other types of uh oh moments that you've met people sort of describing moments they've had like this where they've read books or mm -hmm. heard something or they've met someone in their life. What are some other examples of uh-oh moments that you've sort of 
learned about? Well, yeah, I mean, I um, a few years ago, I, I took a survey on my website, on my blog, and I just asked people, give me one or two things that make it hard for you to stay Christian. Like things that just, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And basically, a lot of the answers boil down to something to do with the Bible. But um, I, I got, I think at the end of the day, it was probably around 300 responses, and I just sort of collated them. And I came up with categories, and a big one is the violence of God in in the Old Testament, especially. But there's some in the New Testament as well. Um, you know, what kind of a God is this? And people are dropping like flies, you know, for all the sorts of reasons. The flood story is an obvious one. The right? flood story, Wiping the sixth chapter of the Bible, right? and yeah. you know, already God's had it; His patience yeah. has run out, and everybody dies. And and you have, you know, in Deuteronomy, a, a chapter of very long sort of over-the-top punishments for disobedience, including like you can eat your children and things like that. And, and you know, the, the conquest of Canaan, the extermination of the yeah, Canaanites, which I talked about. Alive. Yeah. yeah, it's things like that, that that just sort of throw people. And another one is, um, you know, the Bible and science and how, you know, we explain our reality pretty well in scientific terms. But the Bible explains reality very differently. You know, there are storehouses in heaven that drop down hail and, and rain, and sort of like a snow globe. Exactly. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. And With, uh, except the water's outside. The water's right? outside. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, obviously, it's things like you know creation and, and and the age of the universe versus sort of how the Bible looks at it. But it's also things like neurobiology and how, you know, we can sort of explain how the brain works a little bit better. I mean, we don't know everything about the brain, certainly, but, you know, we seem to be able to recreate in laboratories the, the, the brain sensations of things like worship and love and things like that. Or people are depressed or anxious and they take some sort of medication that brings them back to reality where they're able to pray again. You know, yeah. things like that. So yeah. you, you ask yourself, you know, what does it mean to be human? You know, and, and the Bible uses language of sin. And that's a, a topic of long discussion, what sin even means in the Bible. But it uses the language of sin, whereas, um, you know, therapists today may talk about dysfunction or uh, sort of, uh, you know, not functioning well, not coping well and things like that. And and that seems to help a lot of people. So So people have this feeling like, but the way the Bible talks about reality and, and the human experience, it just doesn't match with how I live every day. You know? well, there was also the part in, in that same survey, a cluster of the responses you, you refer to it as falling branches. What was that section about? Yeah, that's uh, God seems to be totally absent or disinterested in our problems. And this was another one of these moments that struck me. Uh, it might have been like 10 or 20 years ago, but on the news... Um, a woman was jogging down a path and she was listening to her uh, head on her headphones and she had a, a one of those portable cd players that tells you how long ago this was but um but she was jogging and a branch broke off from a tree and fell down and hit her on the head and killed her instantly and you know you think she had left five seconds earlier or later it wouldn't have happened it seems like almost timed like what are the chances of that happening you know and and I started I started googling branches falling on people and it's like it happens a lot pretty pretty often but I just remember thinking like what a, what are okay, where's God in this is does he did he make this happen like some people think like it's it's for the good that this happened or did he not make it happen it just sort of lets it happen well that doesn't help either yeah right? could he have intervened why didn't he why not yeah. right and uh you know we pray all the time that god gives us a parking space at the mall How find about your this? keys yeah exactly yeah. so you know it's things like that that um i guess i'd put it another way the, the god's apparent absence in human suffering which yeah. everybody experiences sooner or later. So, yeah. So that's the falling branches. One, another one that you talk about is um, when Christians eat their own. This is something else that respondents to your survey talked about yeah. as an obstacle to their faith. It's a big one, and it's it's the only one that we can actually control. I, I've known over the years many many Christians who have, have functionally left any sort of semblance of Christian faith because of how they were treated by other Christians, especially Christians in power whether in churches or elsewhere. And um, yeah, I mean, that just reminds me of how community oriented the Christian faith is. It's not individualistic. You actually need people and, and you can see the face of God in others. When you love other people and they love you, you can see you, God's presence is with you. But the other side of that is when 
there's just plain old pettiness and yeah. meanness and, and politicking, you know, and, um, and slander and, and, you know, I'm not exaggerating, really trying to ruin people's lives in the name of Jesus. And that makes people say that just, I'm going to walk away from this. Now you might think, well, that's illogical because they don't represent the Christian faith. And I sort of think that way too. I like, I don't want to, I don't want people like that to define what I think about the Christian faith, but still when you're caught in the middle of those kinds of things, it, it's a reminder to me of how powerful the notion of Christian community is, and it can make or break it. And that's Paul's big thing, in my opinion. Like in Romans, for example, it's about the community of believers, of Jews and Gentiles together as one. Because if you don't do that, if that doesn't, if you can't pull that off, you're demonstrating that the gospel simply doesn't work. Oh yeah, it seems to right. be one of his driving. Absolutely, uh, the people quotes. of God. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, in another interview with Elizabeth Drescher, um, she talked about a Christian woman who had been abused uh, in, in a church situation. In fact, she she had been put into a prayer circle and they physically hit her. It's sort of an exorcism mm-hmm. type of a thing. And uh, she she lost her faith uh, subsequently and she got to a place where she couldn't pray because it would make her feel the, sick. It would make right. her feel these feelings. And right. But she still had this desire to pray. She wished that she could. And I right. it reminded me of when you eat a meal and it makes you sick. Yes, you, you can't eat that. You can't again, eat can it. You? it you know, and, and that's kind of what I thought about as yeah. I read that part of the book. Or also maybe sort of like post-traumatic stress disorder yeah. or something, because yeah. it is, it actually, it, it undoes you and, and uh, it's hard to go back. Yeah. You know, you want to find a different kind of community at that point and not, not a religious one or maybe not a Christian one. So. Those are like the unforced errors, right, of, of Christianity, where those are, like you said, the things that we can have a little bit more control over than a falling branch. Right, know? right. It's the only thing we can control and... and and it's the uh, that's why I think it's like it's the worst one in a sense, you know, of those those uh oh moments that people have with the Christian faith. And, yeah. and as you talk about in the book, people can have different uh oh moments at different times in their lives. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and back to the airplane where you had this one, uh, where you, you see this young girl talking about God in a way that you as a uh, as a Christian and as an, an educated Christian caught you up short and you talk about these uh oh moments as uh, something that threatens familiar ways of believing mm-hmm. and thinking about god and a lot of times when those moments happen you might feel your stomach drop and we, we people put up a wall what, what kind of reactions do people have to these uh oh moments well i mean often it's you know when when you sort of feel like your familiar faith slipping away what you want to do is you want to sort of gather it back and stuff it back in the box because you want to get back to that way of having faith that familiar way which is yeah i pretty much know what i believe and here's what it is and i'm very confident about it and feel pretty certain about it maybe in the past it's got you through something difficult it probably has yeah exactly and that's why it's not that the faith is bad or something but right now it's not working and the reaction the tendency is to want to fix it it's broken let's glue it back together again the wall has lost some bricks let's put those bricks back in and mortar it properly let's get it back to the way it was before and I get, you know, the theme of the book and I probably the, the main point of it, the thesis of it is that the deep desire to go backwards and to rebuild what you lost, that might not be the way to go. These moments might actually push us forward to a different kind of faith. And I'm, I would say a deeper faith. And I would also say maybe even a more mature faith. And these uh-oh moments are ones that actually push us maybe to go further in our journey. So, and, and, you know, people sometimes feel like, well, you know, I, I don't want to leave God behind. Well, you might not be leaving God behind. You might be leaving how you think about God behind. And maybe now it's time for another dimension, I guess, of faith where you're not, st- well, you're not clinging to that idea of God, that notion of God that may very well have been important to you at an earlier time in life. But now it's, it's may- might be time to move on to something else. Yeah, you sort of yeah. invite people to reframe uh-oh moments. So I think a lot of readers will recognize what you mean mm-hmm. by uh-oh moment. I've never heard it, it phrased that way, but but I instantly recognize the phenomenon of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you invite readers to reframe it as a God moment instead, and, and mm-hmm. not a God moment, as you said, as a return to... right. You know, Return to Eden, almost. Right. Uh, you've stepped out of the garden at, at that point, yeah. in a way. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a return to the way things were. That's what that's what I mean by the title, "The Sin of Certainty," because it's not that feeling certain is wrong or sinful or anything, but it's the need. It, it it's a preoccupation almost, and a need to get that certainty back. That's that's the sin part, and I don't mean so much 
you're making God wrathful against you, but it's it's not functional. It's not it's not the best way to live. That you might even be seeing in these moments God's presence, but just in a different way, and leading you into something deeper and better. The title itself is pretty provocative, especially um, for Christians, and I think within the Latter Day Saint tradition as well. There's a great emphasis placed on knowledge and on um, on certainty. Frankly, mm-hmm. uh, this idea that that you have the truth and that you know to live according to it, and any difficulties that you encounter are based on not living up to that truth. Right. Uh, and and this framing it this as sin is it's sort of provocative. So walk me through a little bit more about the reason for framing it in this provocative way of the sin of certainty. Well, because, um, I mean, I think, as you just said, we, we tend to think of our faith as sort of a body of truth that we hold to intellectually. And um, I think real faith is much deeper than that, actually. It's, it's, it's about trusting God, which is the subtitle, you know, trusting God more than our holding on to correct beliefs. Because um, trusting is, is more difficult, I think, than having a set of beliefs. It's easy to construct a system of thinking, and you can keep that together for a very long time. Now, eventually life happens, right? And then what happens with that faith system? You start questioning it, or even worse, you ignore what's happening to you, and you just keep playing a game like it's okay. Sort of like, you know, um, you know a, a boyfriend or girlfriend who really isn't good for you and a jerk but you keep making believe like the relationship's really working well it's like you just play make believe and i don't think god wants us to play make believe so we move forward in an attitude of trusting god rather than feeling like we have to be certain about everything because oftentimes we're not and that's what you know weak faith is is usually equated with doubting and I, right. I simply don't think that's the case. I think doubt is part of the journey of faith. It's part of what actually helps us grow, I think, because um, it's hard to have, I think it's hard to have genuine faith in God and trust God when everything is always working smoothly. It's the pain and the suffering, I think, that move us to to a closer sense of, of feeling God's presence in our lives. One of the hard things about that idea is it's especially hard to communicate that to someone who's right smack dab in the middle of an uh-oh moment or right. in, in, a, in a moment of suffering. Because, for example, let's say someone's experiencing the death of a loved one. Right. And and the last thing I'd want to do is to tell them, well, you know, this is an invitation to know God better. Like, well, I wouldn't <laughs> I don't do want that, that you know? invitation, you know? <laughs> that's, see, that's the kind of thing people have to come to their realization on their own at some point, you know? Know, and, I, and I don't say that lightly because terrible things happen to people that, including people who responded to my survey, they, some things they said, I just, I can't believe I'm reading this. And, you know, they're still Christian, but they're a different kind of Christian at this point because of those experiences, you know. So so it's not like a, a, a cheap trick to sort of like, well, here, here's how you get over the hump. Hey, God's yeah. asking you to trust him more. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, you actually have to feel that suffering has to be deep for some people. Yeah. And that may take a long, long, long time. And again, I don't say that lightly. This isn't a how-to self-help book. It's it's trying to describe a very common experience among Christians who things happen to them. They don't have the certainty they used to have, and they feel like they're broken, like they're not super Christian anymore. They don't they, they don't have their acts together. They've been told their whole lives, you got to know what you believe, right? See, and that's when things happen to people if... If they're raised in that mentality, they're going to look at these uh-oh moments as almost entirely negative. And, but I think people who might have been raised differently as Christians to just sort of like let it be and you don't have to have omniscient perfect knowledge to be a Christian, you can have doubts. I think they're more set up actually to be more flexible maybe when these things happen. And actually, at some point, maybe with the encouragement of good friends and family members to to where is God in all this and then to move forward with that. Yeah, it seems to me that this idea has to be baked in deeper into the Christian story in general. And I guess this kind of gets to my 
earlier question about, you know, you can't drop this on somebody's lap when they're right in the middle of an uh-oh moment. But if, if your understanding of Christianity already has this mentality baked into it, then perhaps you're ready to take that step. And instead of seeing doubt as a lack of faith, to yeah. see it as an invitation instead, if you've been set up to understand that could happen, you're right. going to be better off than if you expect faith to be certainty. Right. And then you can be with those people in their suffering. And, I'm, you know, um, I heard Rachel Held Evans, I've heard her speak a couple of times. She came to Eastern last year. And I think it was there at some other venue, but she laid a story about anointing the sick and how she always thought it was so you would be healed. No, it's being anointed for taking a journey. So, for example, if you're, if you're sort of raised then with a, with a different kind of Christian faith that accepts ambiguity and understands that doubt is not the opposite of faith, certainty, certainty is the opposite yeah. of faith. If, if you're raised with that and then you go through a very difficult experience that really tests and tries your faith, you can have people anoint you for that journey that you're on. I mean, if it literally anoint you, and it's that's a different way of looking at it than like burying it and not talking about it, right? Because you're going to feel embarrassed, right? Because people or are going like, to think, "Oh, I, I received a blessing. I was anointed. I need to pocket yeah. this now because yeah. that blessing needs to work." So right? I'm just gonna... <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, people. Um, I think the psychological games that happen with people when they don't feel they can be honest about their experience of faith. I think it's very debilitating. And that comes from, I think, the need to feel certain because you've been taught that a strong faith is a faith that doesn't waver, that's certain, always certain. Yeah, there's this really striking line in the book where you say, here's a quote, you say, church is too often the most risky place to be spiritually honest. Mm -hmm. Expand on that a little bit for people who aren't as familiar with the, the type of um, congregations that you've participated in. Yeah, well, you know, um, it's it's hard because it's embarrassing. You sort of lose face if you, you know, and, and share time at church or in a small group meeting, you might say, I'm really struggling because I'm looking for a job or something. And, right. Or, you know, my neighbor's sick, would we pray for them? But, you, you know, you don't always say, I, none of this makes sense to me like, anymore. I'm not sure there's an afterlife for any Yeah, sort exactly. Of Something yeah. really, really big. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not sure there's a God. Yeah. Right. And I don't and feel God. And I, you know, I haven't felt God yeah. for years. Yeah. I mean, I, I got many responses like that. I've, I've been praying. I haven't felt God's presence for 20 or 30 years. Yeah. So, I mean, t and, and, to be able to say that in church, ideally, that's exactly where you should be saying that. But if the church is oriented around, okay, everybody has their notes about what to believe and what not to believe. We're all ready to go. Let's go out into life and, and just follow these rules and everything will be fine. That's why it's risky because it, they, they feel ostracized perhaps. So people look at them sort of funny, like, you know, they crossed a line. They were too honest or something, you know. And or, I just think that's, that's that a shame. It's almost an infectant kind of a thing. Like, yeah, we don't you want you near that, us. Other people <laughs> might start thinking stuff too. Right. And now you've ruined everything. Yeah. No, you ruined it yeah. all by setting it up <laughs> we, this way. We set right? it up wrong maybe, yeah. yeah. I mean, the church is supposed to be more of a hospital than just a place a country club where everybody has their acts together and everybody's successful in their faith have you experienced that personally where um in the book we'll talk about a little bit later on some of the difficulties that you went through and, and as you were going through those things did you sense uh, a, a sense of loneliness or alienation um no not not me as much in terms of like talking to people i think just because the church context was was much more open and accepting about things. Um, but I can certainly see where people might have felt, you know, uh, sort of alienated and alone. But um, yeah, and some of my stuff because it was related to work issues was sort of public anyway. So people yeah. knew that. I couldn't really hide it if I wanted to. Yeah, when yeah. You, you published yeah. a book that caused controversy at the university that you were at. There were questions about your orthodoxy. You ended up actually uh, over time leaving that university right. and it was yeah. a painful uh, mm -hmm. situation. So it already was sort of public. For yeah, you yeah, it was. It's so, a yeah. different kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that makes yeah. sense. Um, that's Pete Enns. We're talking about the book, The Sin of Certainty, Why God Desires Our Trust More Than Our Correct Beliefs. Um, how did Christians come to see faith as correct thinking to begin with? What are some of the things that led to that sort of thinking? Well, I think in a nutshell, at least, you know, I can't talk about the whole history of the world here, but, you know. <laughs> let's, um, start, let's start in Genesis let's, 1. <laughs> right. Yeah. It all began. <laughs> there was darkness. And, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think looking at sort of the contemporary 
Christian scene in America, let's say the more conservative evangelical or fundamentalist churches that really market certainty and surety and clarity about your faith. Um, I, I think a lot of that stems from about the last couple hundred years in America and you know, especially the 19th century. There, there was a time in at least American Christianity where you didn't have as many challenges to certainty. Um, uh, but then things like, you know, evolution or biblical archaeology or sort of like what they call higher criticism from European countries towards the Bible, um, that sort of... It, Shifting moral it, sensibilities too, about yeah, things like slavery. For exactly, example, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's a whole other dimension there too. Um, you know, those, those are things that uh, affected how people felt they could be sure about their faith because see the certainty is really founded on one thing what does the bible say right and when the bible starts getting complicated like you know most people agree that the earth is you know millions of years old and the universe many more millions of years old and that life evolved and that our planet evolved and the solar system and the universe evolved and those are pretty compelling explanations for most people. The Bible doesn't present it that way, right? So, you know, things like that would, would um, sort of threaten people's faith because it threatened their confidence that the Bible is giving them certain sure information they can hold on to. When that gets threatened, what you tend to do is you fight back. You want to hold on tightly to that. that that's again, that's that's sort of an institutional manifestation of the sin of certainty. That's where you have Bible colleges and Bible seminaries popping up in the late 19th, early 20th century. And that legacy is still very much with us today in evangelical institutions and churches. And an irony that you point out is these institutions often adopt the very assumptions that are causing the problems to begin with, right? There's a fundamentalism and modernism, kind of two sides of the same coin in a sense. Right. They, they both assume that um, God should work a certain way, which is downloading information to us that we can hang on to and be certain about, specifically in the Bible. And when that seemed to not be the case, you know, the modernists, also called liberals, you know, they said, well, I guess none of this stuff is really that true and forget about it. But, you know, the fundamentalists made the same mistake, just a certain, went in a different direction. They said, no, you know, God has to be giving us this pure, certain information and he would never lie to us. And so you spend your whole life fighting against. And you'll work to make it fit. Like, you have to make it fit. fit yeah. Right. Yeah. It, despite let's say, information and evidence to the contrary from the outside. So for a lot of this, it really does come down to the Bible. It usually does for Protestants, at least anyway. It comes down to the Bible. What does it mean to read it well? What kind of information is it giving us? And if you think of the Bible as sort of, you know, God's field guide manual to life where everything in there, you take it as, as um, always and forever applicable and true and giving you pure certainty about life. Um, that, I think, is what runs you into problems later on. Yeah, and so what the book does then after that is it kind of goes through some of these. Uh, you identify four punches that were delivered to Christians, three gut punches, one punch to the jaw, yeah. uh, Darwinism, um, historical criticism, um, and these type of things. And if people want to hear more about that, for, um, in our previous interview, we went through those, and it's also discussed in... Uh, the Bible tells me so as well as this new book. So um, we'll let people check that out there. Mm -hmm. Instead, we'll go right to this very fascinating part of this book. This is new, uh, where you, these are Bible passages that we don't read in church, but we should. Yeah, I think one of the nicest things for people to hear who are actually struggling with their faith is that the Bible is full of examples of people struggling with their faith. People are surprised to hear that. It's in the Bible. I know it's amazing. So, so I give a couple of examples. One is Psalm 88, which is the most negative Psalm. I mean, there's a whole classification of Psalms called lament Psalms because they're lamenting because they're sad. They're frustrated. Where are you God? When we need you, you're absent. You're nowhere to be found. And Psalm 88 is one of those too. It's like, I'm on my knees praying to you day and night. You're not listening. I don't know what to do. My friends are against me. You set my friends against me. And I'm praying anyway, but still you don't answer. And the the the, um, the psalm ends with and and um, my companions are darkness, 
which is a really moving thing. Like his, the only friends he has left, the only comrades he has around him is the darkness that he finds himself in. And unlike most other Psalms, it doesn't have a pick me up after it just ends that way and I, I think it's just it's it's brilliant that the bible has these honest expressions and uh, you know i mean the, the 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 book of psalms also called the psalter was compiled at some point in time and there's a lot of fluidity and and different kinds of even around the time of jesus like the psalms weren't completely settled yet but somebody picked these psalms to stay yeah. and i and i think because they actually reflect um, Israel's experience with God. And, and I think Psalm 89 is even better, the one right after that, because here the psalmist is taking God to task for not following through on a very specific promise. It's an which, indictment here. It's an indictment. He's, he's actually calling God a liar, saying, you said this, now look what happened. And what God said was that David would always have one of his descendants sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. And this psalm is written either during or after the exile, uh, when there was no Davidic king, there was no ancestor, there was no Jerusalem, there was no throne to put him on, so they're in exile. And, you know, how could this be, right? I mean, God said he would do something. So, you know, the thing is that, and, and they don't get this idea from nowhere, because this is something in Second Samuel chapter 7, it's this prophecy through Nathan yeah. to David that, listen, I'm, I'm your, you're my guy, David, and, and, you know, your throne will last forever and all that kind of stuff. It's still in there. They didn't take it out. After they didn't the, take it out. Yeah. And they have Psalm 89 that says, yeah, that didn't happen. Yeah. And, and, uh, there's this, you know, this moment in there where he, he's been going on and on for the first half of the Psalm saying, oh God, your, your faithfulness and your trustworthiness is just, no one can top it. You're the best. You're God. You're almighty. You created the cosmos. And boy, you're faithful and you're trustworthy and all kind of stuff. And your faithfulness lasts forever. Your trustworthiness lasts forever. But then he launches into this David thing. And he says, you know, how long, O Lord, will your, um, will your faithlessness last forever? So I forget how long? exactly. Yeah. How, long? how long? And the thing is that, you know, if your faithfulness won't last forever, maybe your absence will. It's sort of a sarcastic moment there where... It's like, thanks for nothing. You know, clearly you're not faithful forever, but maybe you'll be absent forever because look what you're doing here, right? And it's just this this really honest moment of getting angry with God even, right? And and I think the author of Ecclesiastes is angry with God as well. And Yeah, this and, is one of the two miserable people worth listening yeah. to is what you call it. Yeah, Kohelet in the book of Ecclesiastes and Job. And and again, here's here's the author of Ecclesiastes and the main character called Kohelet who's pretty much blaming God for the fact that life is just horrible. It makes no sense. We work all it's the vanity. time and then we just, it's all meaningless. It's, it's, meaningless, it's, it's yeah. absurd. It's, it's just ridiculous. And, and God set it up that way. So the best we have, the best we have that we can do in our lives is just eat and drink and enjoy our days, enjoy our families. Don't think about it too much. Just go through your life sort of numb because the way God set up the world, it, 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 if you think about it, it's pretty lousy. You just live and then you die and then people forget you. It's, it's really the most depressing book in the entire book. And they left it in there, right? Yes. Yes. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it's just another one of these honest expressions of how difficult it is sometimes to have a sure, certain faith. And, and, you know, those are just a couple of examples. We could talk about the book of lamentation, some of the prophetic laments. It's, it's part of Israel's experience to struggle with God. In fact, in Genesis, the name Israel is said to mean struggle, struggle with God. With God yeah. it, it, it's part well, of what it means. And he wrestles the angel. Right. Know, yeah, exactly. And, um, and he wins, but he doesn't win. Right. <laughs> the separated hip. There's an injury involved yeah, yeah. in struggling with God. Yeah. You see, and, and it's part of the, the, the Israelite experience. And I think that's something that Christians can really look at and say, they're like me and I'm like them. The, the Bible is not sanitized. It's very, very raw, much more raw and honest than we can sometimes be in church. Yeah, there's this great passage that I underlined where you say one of the greatest comforts of Israel's epic is that it contains raw expressions of fierce doubt and lack of trust in God embraced by the ancient Israelites as part of their faith. Right, right. And, you know, so faith can't 
exclude those things by definition. By definition, right. Yeah, to have faith means you're going to have periods of struggling and doubting. Now, you don't want them to last forever, and that's why you don't revel in them and look how cool I am because I'm doubting. It's not like that at all. It's actually, it's truly doubting is very painful. It's a form of suffering. Um, but it's the main thing though, is that that's, it's not unusual though, right? It's, it's, it's a normal part of the journey. Oh no, you don't understand. I'm really, I'm at the end of my rope. I know that that's a normal part of the journey of faith. No, you're really not listening to me. I'm about to give up on everything. And so go read some Psalms, go read Psalm 88 and Psalm 89. They're about ready to give up on everything. Psalm 73, you know, Ecclesiastes, Job, they're about ready to give up. You're actually smack dab in the middle of what is a normal experience yeah. of faith. Now that doesn't mean when you're not doubting, when you're feeling like you have more clarity, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you then, but we have these periods in our lives and we have to accept the, the ups and the downs. Yeah, I like that you mentioned there's a section that talks about like, is doubt cool? Is there this? Is there a danger that doubt itself can become a desired end, something to be sought out? Um, and maybe respond a little bit more to that. You touched on it, but maybe a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, doubt is not something that we seek after. It's something that just happens to us. And in the same way that people who have a, like the sense of like, hey, I know what I believe and I'm better than you because I know and you don't. And the opposite works too. You can have people who, for whom doubt can be sort of like a sexy kind of trendy hipster thing. Like, hey, I'm so cool because I doubt. I don't believe anything. I just doubt. No things. offense to actual yeah. hipsters. No, hipsters are cool people, <laughs> except the bad ones. So yeah, we're arrogant. Anyway. Yeah. Um, it, and and that's, that, that's, that's just as bad to look down on people who feel like I have, I have some clarity about some things. And just because you don't doesn't put you on a higher plane than anybody else. That, that's why doubt comes when it comes. You, you don't invite it. You don't invent it. It will come. You, you will have periods in your life as somebody of faith, unless you've been a Christian for like five minutes and then you die. All right. It, it will happen eventually. And the question is, how are you going to look at that? Are you going to look at that as the enemy to be defeated, to get back to quote normal? You will if you prize certainty. Yes. Or are you going to look at this as a normal part of the journey of faith, which is why I like the journey metaphor. I don't like the, you know, building a fortress or building a wall metaphor because, and that's even used. Like we have to, you know, your wall is crumbling. We have to get it back up again. I'd rather think of it as a journey that we take. And I know it's a worn metaphor and some people think that's trendy. I don't mean it that way at all. It actually is a journey where sometimes it's pilgrim's progress. Type yeah, thing. exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, sometimes it's, it's a beautiful journey and it's a cool breeze, no humidity, not a cloud in the sky. It's about 68 degrees and it's just fantastic. But around the corner, you don't know what's there. You can fall into a pit and have to climb out. It can be dark and rainy. It can be hail coming down and that can last for days and days and days. But the thing is that what you don't do is turn around and go back. You actually have to keep going. There is no going back. You have to, you can't, you can't get back. There is no good old days. You know, even Ecclesiastes says something like, do not ask, you know, why were the former days better than this? It is not wise to ask questions like that. The former days aren't better. You always keep moving forward. Yeah. There's this sense of the sin of certainty to me can be connected closely to the mistake of, of romantic nostalgia and this idea of sort of returning to this perfect earlier time and it's a mirage it's it's right a, it can prevent you from confronting the next step of your faith right uh, you know and, and what's it. what compounds that it's 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 nostalgia and that's bad enough but it's also thinking that god's standing over you with a paddle because you're getting some answers wrong on the yeah. theology exam right. no no that's the right answer don't you see it i i just my faith is placed in a God who's not like that. Yeah. Right. So, um, this is where you yeah. continue to return in the book to the idea of trust. You're trying to say, look, d- despite the certainty or the level of certainty you have about any particular fact or claim, if you have trust in God, and if you at least want to continue engaging with God, if you have that much of a desire, right, that's what God needs, and right. that will sustain you through that, that right. time of uncertainty, or yeah, which will probably let you know. 
few people return to a place of certainty once uh, I think once they've had these uh oh moments instead they right. develop a new type of relationship with God right right which is you know there, there I remember having moments years ago of taking these kinds of steps forward and feeling very very like I would read a book or something that would describe a life of faith very different than what I had been used to, but I knew I needed to do something else. And it was a little bit scary, actually. This summer, I've gone back and I've reread four or five of those books. I'm like, what's the big deal? Because I mean, I'm in, a, I'm in a different place now than I was five or 10 or 15 years ago. And that's, I, I looked at that and I was sort of disappointed. I wanted to get that old feeling back, <laughs> that old feeling of that, that initial movement towards yeah. something different. But it wasn't there at all. It was gone. But I was like, okay, well, actually, that's good because I've sort of accepted. I'm actually different now than I was. And you digested that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And other people haven't. See, that's why I can't go to somebody and say, well, you're feeling certain you shouldn't. Right. That's not my job. I no, mean, that's yeah. the, they have their own life they have to live. But when they get to the point, not if, when they get to the point, when they have reasons to struggle, there are people out there that are using language and describing their faith that might help them. We're talking to Peter Enns about The Sin of Certainty. It's the, his latest book. Uh, the subtitle is Why God Desires Our Trust More Than Our Correct Beliefs. So we've talked about some of these Bible passages that people tend to overlook, these ones that depict this um, anger, doubt, lack of trust, and this type of thing. What about biblical passages that are used to affirm certainty? I'm thinking about, for example, in Luke 8, where the Lord uh, says, do not fear, only believe, and she will be saved. Or you look at where James says that we should ask in faith, never doubting or never wavering. And Paul says to always be ready to make a defense or give an answer to anybody who wants to know the reason right. for your hope. And the, these type of passages mm -hmm. Christians uh, turn to as encouraging that type of certainty. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a misunderstanding of those passages. Um, Are you certain about that? I'm absolutely yeah, yeah. certain, yeah. <laughs> um, the, you know, the uh, the first one you mentioned, Luke 8, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, only believe, you know, the, the word believe in the New Testament is the same word that's used for faith in the New Testament. And is this pistis? Pistis, yeah, yeah in a much better way. I, I'd say a default way of looking at those words. When you see the word believe or faith, put trust in there and see what it does, because that's pretty typically what that word means, right? It's like, you know, Abraham believed in God and God credited to him as righteousness. This is in, in Genesis chapter 15. Abraham believed. Well, the Hebrew word there is the word we get amen from. And you say at the end of a prayer to sort of, it's, it's the last statement of trust, like amen, like you're entrusting this to God. And the Bible talks an awful lot more about trusting God using words like believing or having faith or things like that. That's really interesting because some people think of amen as saying like, I agree, which would line up with an idea of faith as certainty. Like I assent to that. Yeah. Whereas you're saying amen's more of like giving this to word, God, yeah. which is yeah. trust. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it right. even comes down in that type of language. Exactly. Yeah. And, and um, I, that's why I think we, we, we have lost the sense of how much, you know, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. I think that's now, one of the epigraphs of the book. It the is, yeah. Book, yeah. And that's, that, now that's a different Hebrew word than, than the one in Genesis chapter 15, but that's fine. Um, the, the idea of trust, it really permeates both Testaments as opposed to believing in the sense that we sometimes use it, at least in our modern context, which is a thinking word, right? Which is... In the book, I say believe is a what word or it's a that. I believe that God exists. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. And it's almost like a, a list of beliefs. Yes, it's like factual right. claims. Right. And and that's that that's almost certainly not what it means in the Bible, at least almost all the time. There might be one or two places where it sort of hints at that. But, um, it, you know, that that idea of having a belief system is not the focus of the Bible. It's it's trusting in God now. Trusting in God, it always has content involved with it. It's not just willy-nilly whatever, but the primary focus is on trusting God and not yourself dying to yourself, losing your life so you can find it, being crucified with Christ so you no longer live, Christ lives in you, your lives are hidden with Christ in God, all those kinds of things. Those are losing yourself, losing your ego kinds of words, which is which are trust moments. In the book, I talk about people taking a trust fall and what that's like. And there's a reason why they'll call it a belief fall. You know, you can say, 
Uh, you know, okay, if you fall backwards, is that person going to catch you? I, I believe that he is. I mean, I, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't. It would make a mess on the floor. He might get sued. So I, I, I believe that he will. That means nothing. The only thing that matters is when you cross your arms in front of you so you can't put them down and brace yourself and you fall backwards. You have that moment of absolute panic where you realize I'm totally helpless. I have to trust this person is going to catch me. That's the kind of radical trust the Bible talks about. Believing in God, that sometimes has a wiggle room for us. Trusting God, there's no wiggle room involved at all. And that's why I think the Bible talks about it so much. So having beliefs isn't wrong. But what God cares more about is trusting God and not having these beliefs that we line up, that we play games with. And this is where some people might push back on this entire idea because there's a sense in which there's a level of vulnerability that you set yourself up for people don't want to be taken in and with belief right now uh, I'm sure you've probably read some of charles taylor's stuff the secular age that we live in it's it's not a given anymore that there's a god as it used to be and so there's a sense in which we don't want to be taken in and now we're reading a book by pete ends that says you know just trust and some people will say oh well pete's just asking you to turn off your brain right mm -hmm. because if you use your mind you're going to start seeing all these difficulties and all these holes so how right. do you respond to that idea in terms of like oh well pete just wants you to trust because he knows there's nothing there if, if you if it's fact-based you're not gonna be able to make it yeah i i boy, boy we could go how much time do we have yeah. here um <laughs> so I, I i think part of the problem there is is a very modern notion that faith in god works on the basis of let's say analysis or logic or evidence or data right uh, things like things you can test or see or smell or touch of, christians have kind of set ourselves up that way we, we have set like ourselves up for that i know you know right. here's the proofs of god and so right and so, so i think i mean all that stuff is fine on one level but you know w one of my sort of faith claims i'd say is that i don't think that exhausts the nature of reality and i think if god exists there, there is mystery involved that is something that our little mind simply cannot grasp as a starting point. I do believe So why think about anything then? What do you mean? So, well, it, I mean, I like, I like how you're introducing this idea of mystery, right? So, mm -hmm. in fact, one of the big themes of the book is one of the reasons we shouldn't rely on certainty is precisely because of our limited ability to understand things. Right. But some people want to turn that into a, well, don't, then don't. You don't need to study stuff. You don't need to think about stuff. And that runs counter to your entire career and your whole kind of process. Yeah, I mean, ironically, it's the studying stuff and thinking about the stuff that has led me to this point yeah. of view. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's listening and reading, you know, voices through the ages who have thought about this, too, and have come to certain conclusions about what does it mean to have faith in God? And, um, and, and you know, remember, too, the book is written for people who are in some context of faith, I mean, if somebody comes to me and says, well, you haven't given me a reason to believe in anything. I say, well, okay, maybe I haven't. That's another book. That's another That's idea. That's book. another conversation yeah. entirely. This is, this is for people who are struggling with faith, which is frankly most Christians that I know, and saying it's okay. <laughs> I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's room. okay. You're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. You're not a sub-Christian. You're not a tier below super-Christian how they act together because they don't. If they think they do, they're not. They're not as honest with themselves as you are, and well, you're at a point. The uh -oh moment. They, they haven't maybe had those, or yeah. they deny them. You see, they yeah. they sort of like put the wall up, push put the wall yeah, up, yeah. push them away, yeah. and the people who are experiencing some sort of pain or doubt or struggle, I think they might actually know themselves better than those people who seem like they have their acts together. You know, they may be in a more honest. They're their honesty might have them closer to the heart of God at that moment than keeping it, keeping the game together and giving off the, the, the impression that things are all okay. Yeah. One of the things I mentioned earlier is this idea that the book seems to be a way to intervene into the very understanding of the Christian story in a way that prepares people for these uh oh moments. And I think one of the most novel parts of the book is later on in, I think chapter seven, God wants you dead. You actually, lay out a theology of faith that's mm -hmm. patterned on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Is that original to you? And I want you to kind of describe that a little bit. 
No, I mean, I'm trying to think. I've, I've picked up things from so many people over yeah. the years. Uh, you know, and people who read the book will see you You often refer to writers that you've Exactly. Read. People like, I mean, like Richard this, yeah. Rohr is a name that pops up a lot, and Thomas Keating and, you know, a, a few others. So, um, but no, that's certainly not an idea that's original to me. I actually have I've pondered that for a while by reading other people, and I think it's absolutely true that, that you know, suffering and exaltation, death and resurrection are patterns of the Christian life. And the way to experience resurrection, and using Paul's language in Romans, you know, you, you've been raised to newness of life. The way that for that to happen is you have to die first. And you can think of that as sort of a conversion thing, which is fine. You can also think of it as a everyday decision you make. And I remember a, a good friend of mine, a wise person many years ago said, Pete, every day you wake up, you have to make a choice. Will you trust or will you fear? And another way of saying that is every day, are you going to lay down your ego and die and trust God? Or are you going to be afraid because you're trying to hold on to reality in your brain? And to me, that's okay. That's exactly what these other guys are talking about, where the Christian life is a daily dying to self and rising to a more, a fuller expression of what it means to be a healthy human being, you know, as we're creating God's image and all that kind of stuff, right? And I see Paul kind of laying that out. Also, Christ is, you can find it in the Gospels, the idea of the kingdom already being here in a sense, yeah. but also being on the way. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And faith is kind of that way, where it, you have faith, but it's also faith that's still in process, in, this, mm -hmm. in the sense of what you understand and how close you can feel to God at any given point. That's mm -hmm. It's a moving target. It's, it's not the same every day. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and that's why, again, I come back to the journey metaphor. You, yeah. It isn't the same every day, but what's, what's expected of you is to submit yourself in trust to God. And that's different. That's not easy. No. Is that all? Now try it. Yeah, you make it clear in the book too yeah. that you're not offering. This isn't a simple solution. No, uh, it's just a. It's a painful solution. Yeah, because yeah. you don't get to be in charge anymore, you know. And um, I sort of like that at my age. You know, I'm tired of always feeling like I have to be in charge. Yeah. But it can be sort of an intimidating idea too. But I mean, just you know, pick up your cross and follow me. You yeah, know. I love this part. You say, yeah. "Yeah, you don't pick up a cross to uh, to carry it. This yeah. is an instrument of death. This is a right. signal that yeah. a change is coming for you, yeah. and a, a humiliating death, yeah. and an unsettling, um, um, rip you apart it, kind yeah, it's of not a death. Sweet deathbed. No, situation. it's 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 excruciatingly difficult because dying to yourself is a difficult thing to do. And it's you you put faith in that framework that that sometimes these uh oh moments are that moment of carrying the cross and you know what's going to happen with that cross and if you if you engage it in faith you may cry out like Christ on the cross did mm -hmm. why God why have you forsaken me mm -hmm. it's it's a really nice parallel a really useful mm -hmm. parallel which then can your faith can be reborn it. it Right. So there's that resurrection idea right. that's brought Yeah, and you, can, you might even just catch glimpses of glory, so to speak. And But that's enough. See, that's that's nice for people. They, those are God moments where they can look back on those and say, I, I know this will pass, you know. And you trust God in the midst of that. And, and even if you have no idea how or why or what's next, you don't have that kind of certainty or clarity. But you, but you just living with God in that moment. That's Pete Enns. We're talking with him about a book called The Sin of Certainty. When we come back from the break, we'll talk to him about some of the things in the book that are a little bit more personal before we leave tonight. I, I wanted to touch on some of these things, Pete, so we'll come right back after this. Hello again, this is Blair Hodges, host of the Maxwell Institute podcast. The Institute's next issue of Studies in the Bible and Antiquity will feature a paper by this episode's guest, Peter Enns. He recently visited Brigham Young University, along with Hebrew Bible scholar James Kugel and New Testament scholar Candida Moss. Each of them presented papers on biblical scholarship and religious faith, representing Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish backgrounds. Latter-day Saint scholars Philip Barlow, David Seeley, and Jill Kirby were also there, presented on the same theme. Is it possible to approach the Bible critically and religiously? Check out Volume 8 of Studies in the Bible and Antiquity coming out this November. A digital subscription to all the Maxwell Institute periodicals costs $10. You can get your digital pass at mi.byu.edu slash subscribe. 
We're speaking today with Pete Enns on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Pete is the Abram Clemens Professor of Biblical Studies at Eastern University. That's in Pennsylvania. He's a nationally recognized speaker. He's written a number of books, including The Bible Tells Me So, The Evolution of Adam. His most recent book, though, is called The Sin of Certainty. Pete, over the past decade or so, you write in the book, you went through some especially difficult times in your family and also in your career. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and your decision to bring these more personal elements into the book. You, you mentioned about how your career was a bit more public. There was mm -hmm. public discussion about it. But in terms of your family life, you, mm -hmm. you bring up some really personal things. Yeah. And, and, you know, just at the outset, I can just say that, I mean, I've hardly known a family that hasn't gone through very difficult periods. And... Uh, but you know, with with us, and you know, my uh, we have three children, and my one of my children, my uh, daughter Elizabeth, uh, who gave me you know permission to talk about some of these things and how they affected me. But long story short, she had a very long um, uh, battle with anxiety and depression starting when she was eight years old. And uh, Sue and I, we were, my wife, we were just we didn't know what to do. We were beside ourselves, and especially somebody like like me who wants to fix everything and control people and make them feel better immediately. Because I'm a guy, and I'm German on top of that, so I'm, I'm basically screwed. Um, you know, uh, I would like her her my inability to help her would just increase and escalate my anxiety. Yeah, it eats you. Yeah, and it does it each, and and it just. You know, it becomes a part of you then, like you're constantly anxious about stuff. And, um, you know, long and short of it is that, you know, uh, we wound up having to send Liz away for what was about 14 months when she was 16. And which was a really life transforming experience for her and for, for me, I'll just speak for myself, because I really had to let go of that. And um, it was it was a difficult time. I would lay one story and um, sort of a God moment that I had in, in the midst of this where I was just so um, uh, I, I was so anxious because I couldn't do anything to help her. And um, uh, I had gone out to uh, to Phoenix, Arizona, my son's baseball team. He was in college. They did spring training out there. And at that point, Liz already knew that something big was going to have to happen really soon. And she asked me to find a Livestrong bracelet for her. And um, so those yellow, those yellow things, yeah. right? Those the, the, before Armstrong, you know, all the doping thing. That was long yeah. before that. Before but, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thankfully, I also said, no, I'm not going to get you one of those. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I long story short is I couldn't find one, and I looked. And I was sort of disappointed because she she was asking for something that would help her get through the next stage, and I just couldn't find it. So uh, I called her and I said, "Liz, I'm going to keep looking, but I don't think I can find one right now." Because and which is weird because it it was it a big thing. Yeah. yeah, it was all over the place, and I can't find a single one. I'm even calling stores and saying, "Do you have any of these?" And so anyway, we um, while I was in Phoenix, I we went to a barbecue of a alumni of my son's college. He went to Middlebury College in Vermont. And they, ha they always host a barbecue for the baseball team. So we went there, and I got to know the host. His name was John. And he was flipping burgers out on the grill. And I, he reaches out, and there's a yellow Livestrong bracelet on, on his arm. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, he's got a Livestrong bracelet. I bet, you, I bet you he knows where I can get one. And then a thought entered my head that I wasn't really planning on. I said, I wonder if he has one that he can give me. And I thought about all this stuff is happening in my mind in a split second, but I didn't ask that question. I asked the first one. I actually didn't ask any question at all. I just, um, I just said, hey, you've got a lift strong bracelet. I just remarked, I noticed, hey, you've got one. And his answer to me was, oh, do you want one? And he said, actually, you can have a bunch. I have a bag of them in my closet. <laughs> so I just, to me, it was like, uh, you know, it, it's hard to reproduce this in a podcast or even in a book, the, the emotion, but... This is years and years and years of just nothing's getting better and I'm a wreck and the family's not doing well and all this kind of, and Liz is suffering and and all this stuff. And um, for me, that was just a little moment of 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 experiencing how there there was there was a presence of God in there for me that reassured me that I can't control and don't even need to control this situation. You know, all I did was say, hey, you've got a Livestrong bracelet. And he answered a question I wasn't asking. 
would you like one? I've got a bag full of them in my closet. So I took five, one for each of us in the family. And, and uh, you know, th that was to me one of these sort of lessons in, in needing to just, listen, you can't run the universe. It just doesn't work that way. You have to let go. You know, Pete, you're not always going to be sure. You're not always going to be certain about the next thing, what God's going to do and what's going to happen in your life. You have to let go of all that stuff. And at some point, just trust God or not. <laughs> you know, that's, that, those, that's the choice. The choice isn't between, I think I'll be certain or uncertain. No, uncertainty yeah. always comes. The choice that we make is how are we going to live? And, and again, I think, you know, biblically, the, the, the emphasis is on trusting God with your very life, even if your life ends. You still trust God. Or if you didn't get a bracelet, right? I mean, right. This, is, this is the hard part. We talked a little bit earlier about sometimes prayers, like finding your car keys and things like this. Right. So when these these moments happen, and I've had these sort of moments, mm -hmm. um, it's all it, it's easy to fall back into questioning them and to yeah. uh, as happenstance or whatnot. But I feel like that I'm falling back into the pattern of desiring certainty again right. if I do that. Or subjecting the workings of God to our analytical and rational abilities, right? Because, I mean, I, could have, I can explain that away very easily. What I can't explain away quite as easily is the fact that my knees actually weakened and I had to sit down in that moment. I, I felt submitted, <laughs> you know, and, and well, that's a biochemical reaction. Everything's a biochemical reaction in life anyway, just right. because it, that doesn't make it a, not a real experience. And I've chosen to accept that as an authentic experience of God and to just leave it there. And this is now, I mean, what year is this? 2016. This is nine years ago. Yeah. And when I talk about it, I still have that sense of emotion. You know, it's it's that Ebenezer we raise up, like the Old Testament mm -hmm. says, that pile of rocks to remind us of where God was. And and um, so, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's interesting how just you know, life happens to us as a family and, and it's an opportunity to let go and trust God that I wished I had been prepared for and, and to do that act of trusting God many, many years earlier. You know, I, 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 um, I wish I had handled that better from the outset, but I wasn't prepared to, I wasn't raised to think that way, you know, whether it's parents or churches or whatever, that's not the point. It's just that I wasn't at that place. And I had to go through a period of many years of just letting go of my, of, of any illusion that I have that these things are actually under my control and I can be, give myself a certain sure, comfortable, familiar outcome. How do you do that and continue to stay motivated to, to take initiative and to, to do other things. Cause there's a sense in which I feel like there needs to be this tension there. There's, can you err on the side of just saying, Oh, I just don't even need to do a thing. Do you know? Yeah, I guess you could. That's, that's never entered my mind. You know, you haven't um, had a problem it's sort of like, that. I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to sit on my couch and I'm going to trust God to bring an in income so I can pay more. See, there, there is an element also of wisdom, another biblical aspect in here where, no, don't be stupid. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's not the point of this. But it's 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 in let's say crisis moments, right? It's not just I'm not going to live my life every day like not getting dressed. No, maybe angels will dress me each morning. Something yeah. stupid like that, or God will tell me what cereal to eat in the morning. Things yeah. like that. That to me, that's ridiculous. You know, but this is more when your life is actually rocked. Okay. So again, you'd write a different book for someone who... Yeah, for, and I'd have a very different answer. Yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't say, hey, you can't be certain of anything. Just don't do anything. Yeah. I, you know, I would say something <laughs> yeah. very different in, that, yeah. in a book like that. And I won't write a book like that, so don't worry. So as you have talked about this book, and it's, it's, it's brand new out, but you've had an opportunity to talk to different church groups and things. What kind of reactions are you getting from people as you've shared this with people? Um, I... Honestly, it's like overwhelmingly positive. Maybe it's just a small sample set and um, um, I need to get out and talk to other kinds of people. I mean, there have been a couple of like, I would say negative reviews. Um, I'm trying to think of, I mean, one was from, I mean, I'm not knocking it, but like a doctoral student. So, I mean, at some point that like, I think you have to have lived a little bit to sort of like maybe get in touch with what I'm trying to say. I don't expect a 15 year old, for example, to sort of like, oh yeah. Um, 
So that's fine. But uh, I mean, generally speaking, you know, just from comments on social media and emails, I have a file of emails from people and, um, and, and going to churches. I mean, they're, they find it liberating to be out from under the pressure of having to be a perfect Christian yeah. intellectually. You know. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to have mm-hmm. you here at Brigham Young University. Uh, you presented a paper today uh, that will be published in Studies in the Bible and Antiquity, which is a journal that we publish at the Maxwell Institute. So people who are interested in thinking about what it's like to engage the Bible critically and religiously uh, can check out uh, that when it comes out this fall. Um, and then the book that we talked about today is The Sin of Certainty, Why God Desires Our Trust more than our correct beliefs. There's a previous Maxwell Institute podcast episode with you where we talk about the Bible tells me so. Anything else that you're working on just teaching now and kind of touring for this particular book? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that I'm touring. I've spoken a few times and things kick up again in the in the fall. This is actually the first summer since 2008 when I haven't been actively writing at least one book, sometimes two at a time. And um, when this book came out in April, I had already made the decision I don't know what I want to say now. You know, yeah. I, I just, I'm sort of like tired, you know, and, um, but I, I have some ideas percolating that, um, I, you know, I, it's, it's too early to say now, but I, I actually asked my newsletter uh, subscribers to tell me what I should write about. Give you some ideas. Yeah. And there were actually some themes that came through about, okay, but what do we really do with the Bible now? I said, okay, that's a really good question. So it's going to be something along those lines. And I'm I'm starting to get some energy. I started writing some notes to myself about what I think a book like that would look like. So I'm hoping maybe to start in the fall sometime. And uh, But no promises when it's going to come out. I don't know. Is your website PeteEnds.com? Right. So, yeah. And then also people can follow you on Twitter. Pete Ends, you're on there. Right. And, and pretty active on Twitter as and well. And Facebook so. too. Peter, Facebook. I think it's, is it Peter Ends or Pete? Anyway, just by Facebook. I'm up there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time you to bet. talk today. Thanks, Blair. Yeah. Good time. Another perfect landing. No worries. I'm okay. Thank you for caring. <laughs> Just a few bruises. Nobody cares about me. I do, Batman. You sure? I'm positive. Only fools are positive. Are you sure? I'm positive. I fell for it. I should have known. <laughs>